Welcome to the Bite Size Storytelling Show, brought to you by Comiful.com, where we bring you techniques, advice, and stories that will help you on your writing journey. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to our special guest. Caroline is an award-winning NYU professor. She is a TV show creator. Um, she's coached over 10,000, I believe 10,000 um, screenwriters and novelists. Um, so she's worked with a ton of writers. She's also the co-founder of JokeOnASTICK.com. Um, so we're super excited to have her kind of talk about these four magic questions and I'll kind of turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Sydney. So um, I'm gonna ask if you can all now put yourselves on mute because I'm gonna give a short presentation just because time is short. So we're gonna go for about a half hour and then as you have questions, if you put them up on the chat room, uh, at, at the end of the 30 minutes, uh, Sydney will field them. How's that? Okay? And that just makes easy. And it will be interrupted hopefully by people arriving, so just bear with me when I get momentarily off the subject, I'll get back on. Okay, very good. Uh, so uh, the reason that I like to give these workshops is because I'm a writer and I suffered horribly when I was first starting out and um, I didn't have anybody to teach me, so I had to teach myself. And hopefully by sharing a little bit of what I've learned, I will save you years, struggle, tears, and um, just like a waste, a lot of waste, time wasting of energy and teach you how to write smarter, not harder, okay? So the basic idea is that the hardest thing that most of the writers I work with, and I, I'm a writer, I just finished a second draft of a new book, it took me six months, I told Kiana, um, is how to organize our material. In other words, we get the material, but then how do we organize it and tell it without having to do it four or five times, which is what exhausts writers. My biggest thing that I had to uh, work with when I first began working as a coach, because I was working with very successful people who had to come up with another project quickly, and they were tired from the one they were doing, they had no time, and we had to find a way to get the thing working very quickly. So, um, I found a way to talk about structure that made it very easy. So I'm gonna sort of cut to the chase and I'm gonna work backwards. So the, the meat of this, and I'm gonna share the screen, is something that I developed called the four magic questions of screenwriting. And uh, okay, if you can see the screen, or can you people see the screen? Yes, okay, great. Because whenever I share a screen, my, my little computer does all kinds of weird stuff. Oh. I share, I close, you see what I mean? So bear with me one more second, let me get it back up. I knew it was too easy, right? Let's see, where did it go? Just one second, hang on. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, got it. All right. I'm also on a, on a barrier reef island, and so if, if the internet is wonky, that's, that's part of what we, we, we cope with here. Let's try this again. Take two, like they say in the movies. Okay, let me know if you can see this. Yes, everybody can see this? Okay, great. So um, what I came up with was a way of working with the three-act structure, and I assume that you're all writers, you're familiar with it, but I'll restate it briefly. Uh, Aristotle, who was a great dramatist, discovered this a long time ago uh, in a book called The Poetics, and he came up with the idea that all stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end, which was all well and good, except that the middle was very long and people didn't really know what to do with it. Am I, is I speaking to you, right? So this, you have to drag the story for twice as long for the beginning to get to the end. So what I discovered was, if you cut the act two part in half, and you look at what each part of the story is supposed to do in terms of a hero's journey, a quest, you know, a beginning, middle, and end, which is exciting and has momentum, I realized that act two part one did one thing, and act two part two did another, dramatically. Make sense? So we, we imagine this and we go, okay, so act one becomes a question, uh, which is what is the character's dream? And I think someone needs to mute themselves. Uh, 
And so the first magic question is, is what is my main character's dream? Now, rather than teach you, which is kind of boring, let's do the work. So does everybody have a character? Remember we started this imaginary character, or you can work with someone in a movie you love because it works for all stories. And I'm gonna actually show you how to apply it very shortly. So the main character's dream, let's say we're talking about The Wizard of Oz, which I assume that everybody has probably heard of or seen, right? So Dorothy's dream is to find home. Is that true? Right? So that's her dream. Now, the great way, thing I like about the four magic questions is we can jump right over act two, which is the hard part, and go to act three, which is the easy part, and just answer the question of does she win her dream or not? Does she find home? And yes, she does, but maybe not in the way that she expected to, right? And so now when you're trying to develop a story, do you see your, how you already have half your story done in like two seconds? We've been on, you know, I've been, I've been on here for five minutes, right? So can everybody do that for their character? Can they define a simple dream? Uh, if you were dealing with a movie like Star Wars, which I assume a lot of you have seen, if you haven't, the original Star Wars is awesome. Um, and it's just like a, you know, a textbook and the best thing ever. Um, uh, a simple thing is he, he wants to become a Jedi Knight. So you have different kinds of stories. Obviously, you have stories where you have action stories where, you know, people want to accomplish something like they want to catch the bad guy or uh, win a war or something. And then you have more internal stories where it's about finding home and then you find visual ways to express what that metaphor is. So either way it works. So you have the dream and then the resolution. Now, the fun part about working with the four magic questions is that you don't need to know your ending because like life, things end and we kind of have a sense of how they go. They go happy, they go sad, or they go different, right? So one of the things that's fun about storytelling, that unlike writing a school paper or something, is that you don't need to have a hard target. You're not proving your point. You're trying to explore your point, hopefully with your reader and your viewer. So it's a different, it's, a, it's kind of a way of working with a softer structure, but it still never fails. So we have that. So Dorothy wants to find home and Dorothy gets home. That's her, that's our bookend. So if you can do that for your character, right? Now, if you're lucky, while I've been talking, some kind of an image comes in, right? We see Dorothy standing there with Toto, right? Like in the movie. Maybe you had an image like that for the character that you're working with. Grab that and write it down because you can do almost all the character development from that one image. And I'll show you how to do that too in a few minutes. Um, now we have to work a little deeper and get to the hard part. So if, if people are not with me, let Sydney know. Otherwise I'm gonna assume that I'm, I'm making sense. Um, so now we go to the second question. So figure that in your mind, whether it's a short story, a movie, a commercial, a book, whatever it is, you have half your story at least created in some emotional way. Isn't that cool? So you got a lot done and now you don't, now we're going to find out if it's any good. Okay. So act two, part one is a second question, which is what is my main character's worst nightmare? So in Dorothy's case, being stuck in Oz is definitely her nightmare because now she has to get home. Correct. But you can also reverse it and you need to know that sometimes you tell a story where it starts off bad and then it seems like in act two, part one, things have gotten better, right? Certainly in Star Wars, used to use this other example, the nightmare is he's stuck on the planet with his aunt and uncle and the act two, part one, he's on the Millennium Falcon learning how to be a Jedi Knight. That's definitely an upgrade. So let's do that for your story. And again, work fast because you can't lose on this one. You know what I mean? You have a 50% chance of being right. So the bar is very low. Uh, the potential payoff of making a strong decision is the right choice. So make a decision, dream or nightmare. We're going to work with the Wizard of Oz. So we're going to talk about the first act as being the dream and act two part one is being the nightmare. Okay. Now here's where we have the hard part and also the solution to the hard part. The hard part is what the heck is supposed to happen in the second half of act two. Right. And the answer and this is why a lot of stuff is bad is it's not really part, it's a different part of the same movie. And it changes because there, the character must go through whatever they need to go through so they can learn the skills and get the courage to do what they couldn't do in act one, right? Because if they could do it in act one, you don't have a story. And this happens all the time. That's why your story tanks, because you have the setup and then it doesn't go anywhere, right? You get an idea and then, you, then it kind of, this is why. So, 
you have to figure out what is preventing them in act one, but you need to work on it in a very like easy way. Like, you know, the internal conflict is they're afraid, something simple. The external is they don't have enough money or, you know, and DM is too busy. And then, uh, and then we work with the outer level, which is, you know, Dorothy's an orphan, right? That's, it gives you a sense of the, of the three levels of, of story that you're going to look at. And again, this is so intuitive if you think about it, right? Because everybody's got this going on. So you just give your characters a little life. And as I say, a lot of the stuff, if you, especially this, this warm up I showed you, if you do this for 10 or 15 seconds, you'll see that you, your images will just, you know, they'll shoot down. Molly already does that when she daydreams. But for, for those of us who are not as lucky, we got to stimulate this and make this happen, right? So now we get to the hard part, which is what goes into Act 2, Part 2. How do we know what the character needs to go through in order to get to the point where they can solve it in Act 3? All right, now this is why, this is why it's tricky because, you, you know, life is short, you want to aim well, right? So if you're looking at The Wizard of Oz, the most scary thing is what you pick. So for Dorothy, the most scary thing is she has to face the witch or Miss Gulch, whichever way, right? So by knowing that, you immediately know what Act 2, Part 2 is. She must face the witch and either overcome her or not. Isn't this helpful? Right, and this is, this is where you, and right now you can tell if the story you're working on has any legs or not, because if you can't figure out what that conflict is, you may not, right? That's the thing, point, and, then, and it's not that you should abandon it or you should abandon it, you may just wanna say, okay, I need to go back to the beginning and think about what's preventing, right? What is the person most scared of? That's the easy way to find Act 2, Part 2. Make sense? But you can't know that you need to ask the question unless you structure things this way. This is a, you know, as I say, it's a foolproof method. You'll have this recording. If you follow these directions, you will do well every single time. So, and also what happens is you make up a story, you get here, you realize that the character's afraid of something and you're just not feeling it. You know, that's the time to quit because it, it won't, stories never go away. Every, you all know this. Every time you invent something, it follows you around like a hungry dog, right? So you don't have to worry about it going away. You just have to worry about, you know, what you're going to work on right in this moment. And that's really the key. So when you work this way, your components, just to make it very clear, is you have these four magic questions. And when I'm not around, you're going to ask yourself the first question, what's the dream? or the nightmare. And then you're going to ask yourself the fourth question, which is, what is the resolution of the dream? And remember, your answer doesn't have to be, I know what the ending is. The answer is, well, it's going to work out well, badly, or different. And you'll have a sense of, of how you want it to work out, because a lot of times you're writing in a certain genre, or you have a certain message. Um, then you go to Act 2, Part 1, and basically what you're doing is whatever you've decided that Act 1 is and what the action is, you flip it over. So if things were going good in Act 1, they go badly in Act 2, Part 1, or the reverse, but very mechanically. You don't have to think about this. It's just you just literally flip it over. And because you have this idea of the three levels of conflict, which is what's preventing, what the plot is, and what's the overlying societal thing, you kind of, and this is so intuitive, I mean, it's not written down, but you, you sort of get this. You can really know what to do. So now uh, that you've done that, you think of what is my main character's worst fear? What, what is preventing them? And if it's fear, what is it fear of? So in The Wizard of Oz, she's afraid of Miss Gulch or the Wicked Witch of the West. And so it has to be that she goes and faces her. And once you sort of give into the idea that this, there's sort of this, uh, there's kind of an eternal story. And what the four magic questions actually do is there are a, a universal translator between the way we actually organize our life experience and the way we tell stories. So that's why they feel so lifelike right off the bat, because you're, you're working from the way we actually organize things in our brain. All my work's based on, on actual brain science, the details of which are irrelevant, but just to know that you're hardwired to do all of this and that these things that I'm telling you change the brain chemicals so that you can do them over and over. It's very cool. So, once you have these parts and you figure out Act 2, Part 2, then now you have a basic structure, right? So uh, from there, you have to go look at the three levels of conflict again. Now, again, I don't have a slide for them. I will in another setting. I'm in, the, I'm in my summer house. I left things behind. So let me just say them out loud to you. And they're in my book, which is called 
um, how to write a screenplay in 10 weeks, which is you can buy on various places, my website, whatever. Key thing here is that is that the character has to have an internal problem that is preventing them from succeeding. And very often you are writing about the problem you're having. And this is where writers have a really, you know, why it's so scary to be a writer and why you have to be so brave. And that's because you have to dig into yourself because we're always writing about the problem that we're having. So once you are willing to, because that's really what being a writer is, it's taking a piece of our own heart and, and putting it in a, in a story. Once, if you can be honest with yourself and say, you know, I'm really scared of my teacher at school or whatever you're dealing with, now you have the basis. It doesn't have to be, the character doesn't have to be, the obstacle doesn't have to be the, the teacher, just to find that feeling and to put it in your story is what will help you know if it's going to work for you. Now, the next thing you have to do after this is you have to figure out who the villain is because otherwise you don't have anything for the character to go up against and then you won't have any conflict. So that's the other reason that stories don't go. So if your conflict is something like racism, you know what I mean, it's, it's, and you don't know how to make it specific, the idea is that you take someone and you create a character who embodies and goes up against your hero or heroine. So if you're doing a story you know, about racism in the South, you create a racist sheriff to carry the whole societal burden of racism. And then you now, and then what that does in return is it gives you a sense of who your character has to be, right, in act one, and what kind of problem they're gonna have, because they have to in some way go up against this evil sheriff, right? You see how it all starts to work very organically, and, as and I know that you're all seeing pictures in your mind here, right? That's the other thing is once you get these pictures going, then you know that you're in the world of something that will have legs, right? So in The Wizard of Oz, we have the teacher who wants to kill Toto. So that's easy. And then, it, and then she becomes the witch because she was a witch anyway. It's just a question of, of changing the environment that she's in. Does that make sense? So this way of working is, is the way that our creative unconsciouses work. And if you start to, uh, one very good way to get very good at this is to write down your dreams. And when you wake up, don't try to analyze them for meaning. Rather, ask, look at them as stories and see which part of the, of the three-act structure you've actually had in your dream you'll find that you tend to dream one or two parts, not all four of them. And this practice of seeing how you work unconsciously, because remember, we've been dreaming since we were born, at least, right? Three to five dreams a night. This is the basic way we organize our experience. So you are very expert, much beyond the idea of being a young or an old person. You, you have a lot of experience. It's a question of, of calling it in and using your experience to become a much better writer. And because there's another concept where um, a, a man wrote a book called Outliers. And it's, it's a very good book to read by Malcolm Gladwell, if you don't know it. The cliff notes are just as good as the book, honestly. So if you're busy, just, just get the, you know, the little summary on Amazon. But the idea is that in order to do something well, you need to practice it a lot, like 10,000 hours. So people think, oh my God, I'm going to have to write for years before I get to be any good, right, Sydney? The answer is no. You've been practicing it for 10,000 years, 10,000 hours, because you've been dreaming. So every time you sleep and you dream, you have three to five dreams a night, do the math. You're an expert. It's cool, right? And so this should give you a lot of confidence that maybe you didn't have before. But writing down your dreams for like a few weeks, again, this is not for like meaning. This is more to see how your, your unconscious works so you can understand it as a more mechanical thing will give you a great deal of insight. Uh, also, you're going to start to notice that there was current symbolism in your dream. And most good stories have a symbol. Like in The Wizard of Oz, we have the, the red shoes and we have Toto, right? In Star Wars, we have the lightsaber, right? Think about, you know, in Harry Potter, we have the wand and the hats and the whole thing, right? So we have a lot of symbols stand in, especially when you're doing visual storytelling of any kind. They stand in for a lot of explanation. So showing, don't telling kind of means that you learn to use this. <clears throat> and so this really should be enough material. So again, the idea is that you do the four, if you want to do this even more efficiently, start with your villain, figure out who the bad guy, girl, and the villain doesn't have to be a bad person. It can just be someone who's in the character's way and is really preventing them. And you may have a few different ones, which is fine. That's good. You know, you need a few. So if you do the four magic questions for the villain, 
pretending that the bad guy is not bad because all bad people are legends in their own mind, right? No one thinks they're bad except for a few people, but most people think they're good. So what you do is you work with the obstacles points of view and you answer the four magic questions for them. And that gives you further insight into what your, how your four magic questions for your hero are going to go. And this way you really have all the pieces because you have the four magic questions and you know what that act two part two problem is, right? You know how to structure act one, act three, act two part one, act two part two. You know that you're dealing with three levels of conflict, which is what's preventing them, what the plot is and what the societal implications are, um, you know, being an orphan, things like that. And then um, you have this idea of having images come in um, and using that to kind of visualize and see your work. And the idea is that by answering the question, first question, which is the dream, and what is my main character's fear, that is how we get act two, part two. And so if you don't have a villain in this process, by finding out their fear, you, you'll find out the villain. In other words, it's, it's a very synergistic way of working. So whatever piece you're missing, if you do all these pieces, they will come to you. All right, so that's the, that's the basic thing that I wanna share in this very short form. And I want to show you now, um, we, we're, I'm, long story, I'm a novelist, now I do 20 second clips with my partner who is a fantastic artist, animator, and he's, a, he's, the, he's the gag man. So, um, and so we had, uh, we had our first clip that, that got a lot of views, got like 18,000 views on Instagram. And I'm going to show it to you, and I'm going to, I want you to see if you can see the four parts of the act structure in this very short clip, and then we'll look we'll at it again. Okay, so I'm gonna take this down, and I'm going to hopefully, fingers crossed, have it ready to go. Yes, here it is. Okay, let me share it. Okay, I wanna stop the share. Stop the share, and now I wanna share this one. Okay, here, hang on, I'm gonna pull this up. Can you see this now? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm gonna run it. Ready? Honey, after all this time, I still feel the same about you. So okay. Now, this might not be something that, that you have dealt with yet, but trust me, when you're older and you get married to people, it's going to be very relevant. You're going to remember the show and go, oh my God, I wish I'd seen the joke before I got married, okay? So the basic idea is, and we're going to go back and look at it slowly. So the, the first image, okay, this is your first act. It's only 20 seconds, right? And we know a tremendous amount. He's got a girl, he's a good boyfriend he, or husband, he brings flowers and whatever. And then act two, part one is when he says, Honey, after all this time, I still feel the same. Okay, so do we get that, that even though it seems to be a nice thing, we get the problem? That word still, is it sort of a dead giveaway? Right? And then act two, part two. About you. Right, in other words, it's, it's the reaching of the flowers. Like what's he willing to do, right? Because the third magic question is who or what would my main character die for, right? So you see, that's it. And then, this, and then the, the, the resolution is he ain't going anywhere. It's a joke on a stick. Uh, he's committed and he's got the ball chain. Does that make sense? Helpful? All right, so let's, let's just watch it one more time without my commentary and, and just sort of get it on, on an, an emotional level. Honey, after all this time, I still feel the same about you. So you see the four movements? So you can do that for a long movie like The Wizard of Oz or you can do that for a 20 second joke. Now that joke got 18,000 views. So obviously a lot of people must've thought it was funny or something, or they thought it was so awful they had to watch it, right? 
Um, so now, since we are a small group, um, if you want to ask questions, we can do this. And if you don't have questions, I can tell you just a little bit more because we, the time is working out. Um, so the idea is that when you get an idea, remember that whether you're going to expand it into a book like Kiana does, or you do what I'm doing, which is these really, really short, short things. If you have the shape, it's a universal story. And so people are going to respond to your material better because of that. And, um, and then the other part of this is that this is sort of the beginning of my, I have a, I have a writing system that I trademarked. And so this is the, this is like the top part. Then if you want to get more into it, um, uh, my book is called How to Write a Screenplay in 10 Weeks, and I'm giving a, a webinar on, on Thursday evening, a free webinar, um, which, because it's part five and you'll be coming in late, I'm gonna show you actually how to use this next part of the structure to take the four magic questions and simplify it even more deeply. Um, uh, because ultimately, if you're writing anything, you have to break it down into scenes, right? So, um, <clears throat> so since we have a little bit of time, just a brief, again, a, a very short way of working on scenes that you may find helpful. So a scene starts when one character wants something from the other. And so a lot of times <clears throat> when I read screenplays, I'm getting, you know, interior restaurant night. You know, uh, two people are seated at the table, the waiter comes over and says, hi, I'm Ramon, I'm gonna be your server. You don't need that unless Ramon is gonna spill water or stab somebody. Right, because the scene doesn't start there, right? The scene starts when the thing happens. The person leans across the table and says, so, you know, are you gonna give me my money? Right, so we don't, so, so the idea is that, is that writers, we need the training wheels. So it's not that we shouldn't write this stuff. It's just, we have to know what we're gonna show to our reader. And that's something I'm happy to have a moment to talk about. The, there, there's a lot of pressure for everything to be public and you're writing for an audience, blah, 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 blah. It's very important to make it like the olden days when you were allowed to be private with yourself. And the first work of creation is for yourself. You have to give yourself that luxury. It's very hard because everybody wants you to get it up there and show it and so on and so forth. And I deal with this a lot in my business that people put up work that's not ready and is not really quite good enough because you know, we, we, you know, we're writers, we need to reflect. We, that's why we write, that's why we're not stand-up comedians. We can't do it off the cuff. We have to, think about it and, 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 and mull it over and, and, and rewrite it, right? So it's, it's very important that this first work of creation, one of the reasons I like the Four Magic Questions is to have the safety to know you're not gonna make a mess no matter how crazy you are, it makes me feel very comfortable. In other words, you're just not gonna make something that's, have, I and mean, we've all done this, we've come up with some idea that just unravels and it's a mess and it's on the floor and we can't fix it. This way you kind of don't do it, you know what I mean? Because you, you have some, some, some tools and, and those tools allow you to work, and I don't mean neat in the ordinary sense, I mean in the sense of that you can't clean up a mess. This is, you can always make a mess if you know how to clean it up because you built it, right? So this idea that you can have the confidence to try a lot of new material is very, very important. But it's also important because we live in such an interactive society to understand that writers are private. And I cannot tell you uh, well, I teach a, a, a private rewriting class, uh, and uh, one of my students, it's the second draft of the script, they showed it to one of their friends. And the next class, he was crushed because the friend made some comment. You know what I mean? And it's not that it was a good comment or a bad comment, but it was only one person making a comment, and he, it just paralyzed him. So it, it was a question of, of him showing the material a little bit too soon. Right, he should have worked on it maybe another draft and, and been a little more bulletproof. The comment had nothing to do with whether or not the screenplay was well written. It had nothing to do with whether the screenplay was good. It had to do with what the other person wanted the story to be. Right? And that's what you need to be careful of because with the best will in the world, everybody's a storyteller. And in fact, a famous writer, you can write this down, wrote, we're all storytellers until we sit down to write a story. So what separates us is the ability to put our butt in a chair and actually put the thing on paper, and that's the whole game. So the four magic questions are intended to encourage you to do this. 
I'll do this. I'll see something because I, you know, I work, I work on so many stories. I have so many private clients. I mean, I'm, my head's always full, but if I see something, you know, like I saw two people on the beach yesterday with a husky and the husky kept leaping in the air and I couldn't figure out what the husky was doing. And I realized I walked down and I realized that, that, that they were throwing a ball for the husky, you know, making him pace himself to get the ball. And then he was running back and the girl was making a hoop with her arms and the dog was jumping through it. But like never missed, this went on for, you know, 20 minutes. And I thought, oh my God, this is such an interesting idea. Who are these people? You know, uh, at some point she handed him the ball, the boy, her boyfriend or the guy she was with the ball, and he just didn't want to play with the dog. So I'm like, hmm, you know, oh, conflict, goody. You know, what's going on in that story? You know, what's the problem, right? You know, they're fighting over whether the dog gets, you know, vegan uh, uh, dog food or, or meat dog food. You know, like just, you know, making up stuff, whatever comes into my head, right? And imagining what they do with this dog, you know, is this, is, is, do they use this dog on their YouTube channel? You know, like, like what, like, like, why would you go to all the trouble of training a dog to jump through your arms and then do all these other tricks? It was amazing. So what I'm going to do, because I'm like everybody else and I'm afraid that I'm going to do something stupid, right? I, I'll be honest, right? We're all writers. We all have fear. I dictate into my phone. Honestly, I send myself an email and I dictate it in my phone. No one's going to see it. And what I'm doing is I'm not up to the four magic questions. I'm trying to get those butterfly images that I was telling you about. This is, this is, I think, the secret to becoming a great writer quickly. The butterfly image, seeing the dog jump but not knowing why. I'm going to get that. Then knowing why. And then wondering why the heck he's jumping through the girl's arm. You see, just in other words, when you use the four magic questions, you, you sort of automatically organize what you're watching into story. I mean, it takes a little practice. But to me, that's the cool part. And then I'm immediately, you can hear what I said. I said, so, okay, they're happy. The dog, I want to know why the dog is doing that. What do they do? <clears throat> you know, what's the conflict in the story? They're getting the guy ready for an amateur dog show on YouTube. I've made that story up, right? The conflict is that for whatever reason, he doesn't want to play with the dog, right? So there's a lot to, to dig in there. Uh, we don't know if the dog went off and bit him. He doesn't know if they're having a fight about something else, right? We don't know if the fight is about the story or whatever, but we do know that the girl is obviously the leader because she's the one who's holding her arms. And maybe that's what the fight is about. Who's going to hold the arm? You see how you start to think of possibilities? So in my version, because I tend to be a happy person, I'm going to say my ending is probably going to be a happy ending, even to a different ending, right? In other words, uh, you know, he's had bad luck with the dog and the dog doesn't really like him. But after coaxing him in the basement for weeks with treats, you know, on YouTube, now he holds his arm and the dog finally jumps through the right? See the big smile you got and how there was a feeling of happiness? That's how we know if we're storytelling because I'm connecting with you, right? We don't know each other and yet we're at the same campfire now. We could be eating marshmallows and it's, it's that comfortable. And you can see what I'm talking about. You can smell the water, right? And you can, right? And you can see the dog's tail because it's the curly husky tail, right? So I'm going to record all these bits and pieces into my phone because I'm never going to get them. And remember, I'm like always, I'm dealing with fear. I'm always blocked by, I can't get it right on the first try because I'm afraid I'm going to be embarrassing myself or something. So I've got to go around that big block of fear and not worry about it. Just, you know, go for the butterflies, knowing that it will sort of, you know, organize itself. Make sense? All right. So if people have questions, you can jump in. We have a, we have a little bit of time and you can just unmute yourself and ask because we're a small crowd. Otherwise, I will keep telling you good stuff. Okay. Oh. I have a question. Sure. Uh, this was already touched upon a little bit, but what are telltale signs that your story is going nowhere? <laughs> That's a great question. I'm not laughing. If the essence of humor is the unexpected. It was your phrasing, not the content. Very good question. Oh, okay. All right. I love that question. So the answer is you can't, you can't, you can't figure out what happens at the end usually is why. Right. If you, if you don't see an out, like in other words, as soon as I saw the two people with the, the hoop, I decided that the problem was going to be that the guy couldn't get the girl, get hit the dog to jump through his arms. And that, that has to do a lot with who I am and blah, blah, blah. But that's what you're, you need the bookends. Okay. That's, that's a great question. And um, I'll mention that I have a, a website, which is MarilynHarwitz.com, no surprise. And I have a newsletter. Um, and um, in the newsletter, I have prompts. Now this week, Brighton is a technique called bookending. So if you go subscribe to the newsletter, you'll read about it. So the idea is you start with one image, you end with the other image. If you can't do that, that's why your story is not moving because you don't know what the character wants. So what you've got to ask yourself is two questions. 
well, three questions. One is, is my character really a good character for me? Am I interested in him or her? Does, does, is there some personal connection? Not meaning they have the same problem, but is there a reason you know, they, remind me of, they remind you of your uncle that you liked? I mean, there's some personal thing and they're interesting, right? That's one. Second thing is, what is, the, what is their dream? Because that's the first magic question. And the second question is, what is their fear? If you can answer those questions, you, you, that's the reason you're stuck is you don't know those questions. Because it's their fear that drives the story because you know in act two, part two, they gotta face that fear, right? And then the last question you wanna ask yourself is who is the villain or the obstacle? Because that's the other reason, because if you don't have tension and you don't have, have conflict, you don't have any momentum, right? And if that doesn't work, there's one more thing you can do, which is you can ask, you know, what is like, what is the, the message of my story? Right? Like, so the message of, of the one I just made up about the husky jumping through the guy's arms, love conquers all, right? That's the message. That's why you all smile. So a message or a theme is another way, reason your story is not working because you don't know the experience that you want people to have. And Kiana, as a novelist, this is something to consider when you're writing your next novel, right? By, by being clear about what your message is, but asking it as a question, your, your ability to get this thing organized is gonna be amazingly advanced, right? Because you, you know what the character has to go through to get to that point, right? So if I were doing a novel about the, 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 the girlfriend, the girl and the guy and the, I might make them brother and sister, right? I might change the playing field and I'd say, okay, they're brother and sister. Uh, they come from a family of, you know, circus trainers, you know, like in their, their and, and uh, he was bitten as a little boy and he's afraid. And so it becomes his story and he has to overcome his fear. So it's the reason that the dog won't jump through his arms is because he's scared of the dog, not because the dog is dangerous. He has, he has an old issue to deal with. You see, and now doesn't everybody want to watch the story or read the story? Right, because, because we relate to that. We've all been, I mean, if not bitten by a dog, we all have something like that, which makes us afraid to, to do the next part of it, right? To get to the next level. So, right, and that's, those are, you, you, you can't fail if you work that way. Um, and um, again, you know, I, I, don't, I don't need you guys to spend any money, but if you want to take a look and get a copy of the Four Magic Questions, which you can get on my website pretty cheap, it's a good thing to have because then Brighton, you put your story, you practice, you know what I mean? You'd watch a movie that you really like. Because action genre is hard to write because it's a lot of action. Like I, I work on a lot of action stories. So you have to sort of, sort of come up with a story without the action, right? Like I'm working on, on a story with someone who is a, a bad criminal and he's trying to be a better criminal, but he's just not mean enough, right? And he finally figures out um, that he has another gift in this particular story, which is that he's a card counter. Do you know what that is? When you, when you gamble, he can count cards. So he realizes that he doesn't have to be a bad criminal. He can just be clever. And then he finds out that his friends are going to do something bad and he has to stop them. But the whole thing is an action movie. You get that, Brighton? In other words, I'm just telling you the, the basics, but everything is guns and battles and fist fights and whatever. So one, another way to work on material is to get that basic story and not worry about the violence and then add that later. And you do the same thing with comedy. You want to get a human story that's about a person having a personal problem that they must overcome, right? That's why, you know, like movies like Star Wars, like, I, like one of my favorite movies is, did you ever see Blade Runner? Have you ever watched Blade Runner? That's, that's a classic example of what I'm talking about, right? That, that's, that's a good one. Um, and there are lots of, of recent ones, but that happens to be one of my favorite ones. Um, another movie that I always recommend when people are writing action movies is an old movie with Will Smith called Enemy of the State. And why is because basically he gets the bejesus beaten out of him for, for the first, until the end of act two, part one, then he gets beaten up even worse in act two, part two. And then he realizes what they're doing to him and he does it back to them. And that movie does not get old. I'm like, yeah, you know, get them. So you want to, you, as, a, as a person who, 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 who does movies or writes or whatever, what people don't do enough is they don't do enough reading. 
you know, they, they, they don't, they don't do, they don't do enough reading. And um, I love Commonful because I can go and read a little piece. What I personally do is I go to Amazon and I read the samples because I want to see what the words feel like, but I'm, 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 I'm more interested in the structure. So I will, uh, like I had to work on a, something professionally. There's a new book out called uh, Educated. And it's about, you know, a very distasteful subject. Um, and I don't like stories about that, but I, I had to work on it. So I went and I read the first sample on Amazon. So I got a sense of how she writes very well. Then I went and I bought the summary because I was going to have to look at it, but I didn't want to have to experience it. Does that make sense? Because it was yucky. And so then I, I read that and I thought, okay, I need to look at how she, how she actually wrote it. So then I bought the book and I read the ending because I needed to see how the last four or five chapters were, okay? So, um, and, and even if I'd like the book, because you're writers, we are not allowed to read for pleasure unless we decide that we're reading for pleasure. Otherwise, you've got to learn how to work. And it's the same thing with movies. You've got to start to look, watch the first act, the third act. Then you go back and you watch. And this is the way that you learn the practice of, of becoming not, not a fan, but a writer and, and starting to see the mechanics but this is a, a soft way of learning so it doesn't turn into a formula. You don't want to be a technician. You kind of want to be more like a cook or a bartender. Make sense? In other words, you want to learn how to mix it up, but you don't want to learn how to, how to turn it into a science project. That is like going to really shut you down. But this way of reading things, but the idea is, is, is we don't read enough. And so um, what I liked about Comiful is I could go and I could read 20 things like in 10 minutes. So I really appreciate the site very much. But it's good to go to other sites. Like there are a lot of sites that have free screenplays. You can go and read, um, you know, a, a screenplays. Um, uh, a lot of screenplays, like The Wizard of Oz, is pretty easy to get on Amazon. So it's important to 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 put, you know, to whatever genre that you're working in. So Brighton, I would re and I would go back to the like the '90s and read some really classic scripts like Blade Runner. And look at how, you know, you know, in the olden days before all of the, 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 the constant barrage and the attention being constantly distracted, how a good script was done. And I cut my teeth on, um, on uh, Die Hard. And one of the things I loved about Die Hard is that it's supposedly written by two guys. They would walk right past each other at a meeting they never met. You know, and I just thought that was so cool that the story kind of did itself and, you know, the writers were just kind of service, but Die Hard is a brilliantly constructed, very simple movie that has all the things that I'm talking about. And the script is very well written, easy to read. And unlike a lot of modern scripts, it's not fancy. It's very plain, but it's written to be shot so that you can, each of the scenes is a word picture. And there are lots of modern stories, but you know, modern, the problem with modern stories is, is because of the effect of the internet, there's a lot of people get very fancy, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of bells and whistles and alternate realities and people coming back from other planets and, you know, past life regressions and stuff like that. And that's all great, but that's garnish. You, you still have to learn how to tell a basic story. And can, I, can I ask a question? Sorry to interrupt you. <clears throat> I was actually thinking about Die Hard a bit earlier. Then you mentioned this, so I thought it would, could, could uh, be a good thing to just bring this up. Um, when we're talking about the outer goal and the inner goal, I mean, John McClane obviously wants to defeat the terrorists and free the hostages, but on the inner plane, he wants to reconnect with his wife. Yes. Um, how do you, um, st when you start writing a script, um, do you start with the inner goal or the outer goal? I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure how they worked when they yeah, came out with the story. I mean, I think it's based on a book originally. Um, but, I, I mean, there's there are two different goals. So if you can oh. talk a little bit. About that's, that. That, that's another really great question. It's, it, this, is, this is why you work with, with imagistically and you work with the character's dream because you're dealing with the internal dream. But it doesn't matter. Okay, Matthias, did I say it right this time? Excellent. Awesome. Okay, it doesn't matter. Everybody has a different process. One of the things about studying the brain is, is 50 people do it one way and 50 people do it the other way. So the main thing is, if you can get an image of your character, you're gonna be able to know both. That's why you wanna work with an image because then your right brain, your left brain, because the left brain is like the outer goal, right? And the right brain is like the, the, the image of what the character wants. You know, a dog jumping into their arms and the left brain, wants the guy to catch the, 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 the woman who, who stole her purse, you know, 
In other words, so so when you when you when you open yourself to working and you do some kind of you know uh, uh, integrative breathing or exercise just for a minute or two, you start to, you work from the image, and the image helps you unpack it. Um, as I say, um, uh, uh, you might want to take a look or invest in a copy of How to Write a Screenplay in Ten Weeks because it really addresses how to do this. Because there's egg and yolk styles of creating. For for me. I'm, as you, as, as you heard, my process is, I'm interested in the dog jumping through the hoop. So my process is to find what's unusual about the situation and work backwards into my characters. Because otherwise you write very ordinary stuff. So part of our work as writers is to become very attuned to what's different and unusual about a situation. Watching two people play with a dog on a, with a ball on a beach is not interesting. I mean, yes, of course it's interesting, but it's not story material, you see? So if your character has an interesting dream and it's verbalized, like if you have a character, in other words, Die Hard is a, is a great thing for you to think about because it's an interesting story because the inner and the outer goal would seem to be so different. But if you look at it thematically, he wants to be a good man. His dream is to be a good man. Does that make sense? And the definitions of being a good man are being a good cop and being a good husband. You see, so you, you go right under these two things and you find the real dream, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, right, it's like everything that's going on around us, we're being told that this is happening and that is happening and we're separated and everything's bad. But we all have the same dream. We want happiness, we want harmony. You know, we want to have happy lives where we're peaceful. So it's like that when your stories, you get a lot of, a lot of things competing for your attention. But the idea is, the way you can decide is, well, what do you, what's your dream? And I'm sure, because you're a human being, that one of your dreams is to be a good man, however you define that. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. So, so the idea is, so there are, things, there are things that you can know. So, if you, so you know, women want to be good women, but we define ourselves differently than men. Right? And so it, it requires understanding of human nature, and you, the human nature that you have to hand is yourself. <laughs> So if you understand that, that part of your quest in life is to be a good man, however you define it, then you can say, how do I define it in three levels of conflict for myself? And then how would my character define it in their three levels? Does that make sense? It's a very Sorry. simple, but the, the reason that this is not easy, it's simple, is because it requires you being willing to really connect with your real self not the self you're showing to me in this class or that you show other people, but the private self when you're alone and, and underneath all of the, as I say, the difficulties, the fear that you're not gonna create something good. You have to find a way to be peaceful and understand that the only thing that is original is the real you. It's hard, this is the hardest thing to do. So again, a way to work with that that, that is not so difficult is I'm, I'm a certain gender, however I identify, right? Um, I have certain dreams. And in me, how they fit the three-level conflict is I want to be this way about work, this way about love, and this way about faith or myself or whatever that is. And then you can work outwards from there. Is that a helpful answer? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... That's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling myself with the screen I'm writing regarding the outer and inner goal. Um, it's a tr tricky balance, you know. It's a tricky balance. You don't balance. want one to overtake the other. So to speak. Um, yes. Yes, the main thing, though, is to start writing. Because once, oh, yeah. once you get the characters, you know, write a couple of practice scenes. Once you get the characters going, and as I say, you might want to take a look at, at my book, How to Write a Screenplay in 10 Weeks, because basically what people say to me is, I wish I'd found you first. I've read everything else. So you may, might find that the, this very simple way of working takes all the stuff you know and lets you just go, okay, I got this. Right. Right, I can well, buy a copy. Absolutely. Sounds really interesting. Very good. So, so we're kind of down to our, our last three minutes. So I can probably take one more quick question if someone has one. I have a question. Which, Who is so it? My question, ah, my question sure, is but, that, yeah, like, We've touched all of that, like the main character's dream, but how do we know we've gone too far? Like, like we know, like, 
too much of everything is bad so like too when do we know that too much it's too much comedy it's too much suspense it's too much action how do we know that while we're it's, writing a great question which i have to ask her with another question okay and this is by the way as an aside this is the way you deal with all the big questions of your life whenever you have them like what's my purpose and is there a god here's the here's the way you do it you go when <laughs> what's my purpose when is there a god when <laughs> <laughs> so, Shub, in your story, the question of, of, of too much is when, when you're creating, when you're presenting, and that's how you start to work with that material. And I'm, 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 I'm being humorous, but I'm also being serious. In other words, the when you're, you're, is, is when you're actually going out to market and you start to get further away. When you're first creating, as I said before, if you, if you create to be funny, you're going to fail. If you create a good story and you add jokes then you probably can't have enough jokes if they're funny. The way that you deal with comedy material is you need to balance the emotional journey against the jokes. And you don't want to have a joke cutting a serious moment where the character has to deal with something emotionally. This is just like a, once you get the hang of this thing, you will write comedy if you're, if you're funny, <laughs> effortlessly, because you'll understand the serious from the thing. When you're writing action, what you do is you look at other movies to see how much you can squeeze. You have to, this is a practice issue. It's a great question. Understand that the reason that, that, that books and movies don't translate well is because there's way more in books than there is in movies. And you have to decide what you're going to focus on. Um, when you, when, you, when you, you, you have too much character stuff when you're in your head about the character as opposed to being able to see them move around and hear their voices. Right. Once, once you know how they're going to behave and, and what their voices are, it's time to start writing and stop overthinking of it. Because the, the, the biggest danger is that once you go into your head, the characters get flat again. Does that make sense, Shub? Yeah. So the big question is, the big question you always want to ask is when, when do I have too much? Right. And you can, you look at other things as a reference until you start to internalize it. All right, a lot of this is practice. It's reading, it's looking at other material, but not as a fan, learning to, to understand it on an intuitive level, not a scientific level where you're dissecting it. That will not help you. That will make you self-conscious, but doing it the way I suggested, it's juicy. You know what I mean? You kind of go, oh yeah, I see. Oh yeah, there's that fourth, there's, there's that question. Oh yeah. You know, like I see, I had, she was right. I had it all the time in my dreams. Like I know what I'm doing. And so it's just a question of, 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 of practice and, and, and observation. So that's all of our time. If you found this interesting, be sure to like, subscribe, and give a special thanks to our volunteer instructor. Reviews and likes really go a long way and help us provide more awesome writing resources to the Comiful community. If you aren't on Comiful yet, you can join a community of poets, short story authors, and fan fiction writers on Comiful.com.